Hello, and welcome to the Growing Leaders Podcast. This podcast exists because the topic of growing a next generation of leaders is about the most important topic you could ever talk about. Um, it's an important one if you're a business leader. It is an important one if you're a young person. Uh, of course, young people care about young people. And if you're a parent, by the way. But it's also really, really critically important, Christine, if you're a church leader, um, because one of the things that we've seen happen quite a bit over the last while is a next generation not finding an interest or a place in local churches, mm -hmm. which if you're a church leader, that's kind of scary because often it's your own children or it's, or it's the kids who grew up in your church and they're exiting. But also for many churches, they're getting down to the point of if something doesn't change, they won't exist anymore. So what are we going to talk about today? Yeah. Well, spoiler alert, it's a little bit in the title, Field Notes from a Church That Goes. So we'll be hearing from a good friend of ours, um, a pastor who pastors a local church here in our area called Covenant Life Church. Um, you've met him before on a previous episode. Um, but yeah, it's a really important conversation around how does a church get out of its walls, uh, beyond its walls into the community, not necessarily to grow its church, but to grow the kingdom. Yeah. I'm going to do a quick history of evangelism, which you and I both care a lot about. I was listening to something, um, it was a podcast from the guys in charge of Exponential, and they had a guy from Wheaton on there doing a quick history of um, of evangelism. And I, I felt like as I listened to it, it wasn't going chronologically, but I realized what he was doing. So he started by talking about Billy Graham, who would, Billy Graham, you know, would do these big tent revivals and later these huge stadiums. And nobody was better at evangelizing than Billy Graham. Like he could just talk to people in a way where it became so easy for them to respond. And so that model of Billy Graham standing and doing what we call proclamation or proclaiming the gospel really worked. There'd be an altar call. People would come forward and their lives would change. Uh, but there was also in, in a little later time in the 1950s, a guy named Bill Bright starting in campus ministry at UCLA. Uh, he started to, to do some of the same kind of work, but instead of ministering in stadiums, it was in campus groups. And it was mobilizing young people into Christian fellowship, but also into sharing the gospel one-to-one. -one. And they had these little booklets, the four spiritual laws. So one guy was proclaiming from a pulpit. Another guy was was teaching people, mobilizing people to proclaim on the beach or at spring break or you know outside of a hotel or on an elevator with these four spiritual laws. Both were about proclamation. With every single model that has occurred in history, there were really good parts. And a lot of people met Jesus through those two. And I was really honored to have met Bill Bright. Never met Billy Graham. Would have loved to. Um, the One of the problems that happened with those guys is you you lead a lot of people to Jesus a lot, and specifically Billy Graham in the stadiums. But, okay, you've caught the fish. How do you clean them in discipleship? So um, in the 80s, there was... A, a bigger focus on incarnation, on becoming something that that welcomes people in, and uh, Bill Hybels and and Willow Creek and some of the seeker services. They they kind of tried to to become something more a little bit. I think that's a there's there's a whole another level of true incarnational outreach that came later that we'll get to in a second. But there was some of that. But incarnating is where you're becoming something beyond your words that you're shifting um, to allow people to see, touch, taste, and attractive gospel. Um, there were weaknesses with that group in that you would kind of come in to something that tasted good as a consumer, and it was hard to shift the people who came as consumers into being um, disciples. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, there was also John Wimber, who was great. He wrote the book Power Evangelism. He taught at Fuller Theological Seminary. He was a really, really great guy, but his focus was on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and where you did the stuff, the stuff you see in the book of Acts, the stuff you see in the Gospels happening. And when people would experience the power of God demonstrated, so demonstration, got proclamation, incarnation, demonstration, they would come to know God. Again, you still have the same questions of how do you disciple them. In the next years that have followed, we've had a lot of things, a justice and a focus on community engagement and getting out there and doing so incarnationally. And as you look across that whole history, um, what's interesting is that 
at the same time, there's been that thread of those are the groups that have been effective because there's been a lot of other things that weren't effective. You hire this consultant to come to your church. He does this rally. Nothing ever happens. I, I would say friendship evangelism should be mentioned in there, too. That was a big part of the 80s and 90s that did work through relationships. But even with each of these pieces being touched in different moments, it never really caught on to change the way churches work. And churches were very much about come to us and we'll try to make it great to come to us. Um, as, as you hear all of that and we're getting ready for today's podcast, what are some of the things that you see as a bridge between what we're talking about today? Mm, that I see as a bridge. I mean, I, it's an interesting question. I think all of it's a bridge. Yeah. I think cause it all builds. Um, and I think I'm trying not to cheat here because we've already recorded the segment that we were talking about. So I'm trying not to give get the cat out of the bag. Yeah. Um, but I think it all builds. It's all everything from what Billy Graham did to where we ended up in the 90s has got us to where we are today. Yes. Um, and so without any of it sequentially, we wouldn't have been in this exact moment yeah. um, as believers in in the U.S. and here in the South. Um, but I think it's we're in one of those shift moments where in each one of those things, whether it was the tent revivals to the stadiums to some of the, so from going from demonstration to proclamation to incarnation and every, and then some of the French evangelism stuff in the 90s, all of those things were shifts that happened culturally and within the church. It was all kind of cutting edge for its time. It was something new someone has done. Each one of those things led to a kind of revival and I've, as as you were, as you're talking, I was thinking my entire life in growing up, having grown up in the evangelical church, I've heard revival is coming. Like right, someone says revival is coming. Oh, revival is coming. Oh, what does that even mean? Um, but what what I think it means is, it we're it's we're encountering Jesus in a new way, and it's overcome us, and it happens for a group of people. I think often we miss it. I think there's these different opportunities and us as believers, as a church, we miss it because it's uncomfortable and it requires us giving up whatever it is today. Because in each one of those moments, there was sacrifice made to get to the tent, to experience the power of God that led to that revival. Yeah. Um, people were at the end of themselves. And so there was nothing else they could do but just get there. Yeah. And we're really comfortable today. Many believers watch church online now because it's easier to just check in virtually than have to get into a building to deal with other people because of our anxiety or because of our fear and security or just the inconvenience of time. There are more people at brunch on Sunday morning here in Atlanta than there are people sitting in churches. Um, and so it's it's a lifestyle thing that's happened culturally for us. For And I say this as a millennial, as a younger believer, or a mid-age believer now, whatever. Um, I'm not laughing. laughing. I'm not laughing. <laughs> Everyone says the millennials are the younger ones, too, okay. so I'll take it. Um, but it's, I can say this for myself and my peers. When you're, it's been a long week and your kids are being weird and it's like Sunday morning and like you were up all night dealing with vomit or whatever. Do I really want to get up and like go to church and sit there and like, sometimes no, but that is what it takes. Like it takes being uncomfortable and being in a group of fellow believers to really encounter the pre I can I encounter him at home sure but is it something else when I encounter him with a group of other believers yes and what he does when we're together it's different than what he does when we're alone we weren't made to walk these lives and lead these lives alone we were made to walk with a group of people um but then the trick is is when this group of people gathers what does he do with us and he sends us um and it's different today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, for a few reasons. One, because of the cultural needs with what's, a, what's come up in culture is different than it's ever been between mental health and sexual fluidity and culture and like all that stuff. The issues are different, but the issues are the same. It's sin. And so can we as believers get out of our constructs of what we believe and go meet people and just love and serve where they are to um, extend the kingdom, not to grow our business or to grow our church or to grow our ministry, but to extend the kingdom and to grow the kingdom of God. 
um, that's that's the bridge. It's everything compounds to this exact moment. But what do we do in this exact moment? It requires more of us than it has for us ever before, not than it did for them 70 years ago. But it requires more for us in this moment than it ever has, because this is that moment where we have to make that shift culturally into the next place. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I think as you're saying that, what it makes me think is before these were all extremely effective glimpses or slices of what it takes to evangelize. But what it's taking, uh, what is required of us right now is not to be a church that does things the way we've always done it, that goes out to evangelize. But it's actually to take these things that we've learned and actually shift who we even are as churches. Like instead of having this great moment where you go out to reach somebody and then you go back to the way we've done church, it's really a complete shift. Like what it takes to reach somebody's heart is for it not to be about you, not for it to be about what you do on Sundays, but to be about walking with that person through where you see the love of Jesus transform their lives the way it did it us. This shift that's required next is not just to give that moment to that kind of life, but to become a group of believers who live together that way all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a shift in the way church is, where church doesn't revolve around us, around our program, around our people, but it revolves around the power and the love of God and the sending heart of God who cares just as much for them out there as he cares for each of us in. And that doesn't mean to devalue being inside. In fact, that's going to become richer, deeper, mm -hmm. stronger, greater, more electric. But it doesn't have walls. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have segments. And uh, I think today it's very exciting then to be talking with, you know, Pastor Chris Hyatt from Covenant Life Church up in Gwinnett County, uh, Georgia, very diverse county, as we'll hear. But I think this is a church that's really stepped into this mm -hmm. and they're doing this. Are they perfect experts? No. They're engaged with the wild goose of the Holy Spirit, and they're watching God do really, really great things that I think take all of the pieces that we just talked about of incarnation and demonstration and proclamation and of, of um, going out into the community and engaging and are, we're, are seeing a church change its community, but seeing the process change the very heart of the church. So I'm excited for this today. Yeah, me too. Let's get to it. Welcome back, everyone. Yeah. Um, as you heard earlier, we have a special guest today. Woo! And it is none other than Pastor Chris Hyatt, which, if you've been listening from the beginning, Chris was on our, on our first episodes. We were talking about what is an Abbey Church and how do you get one. Um, and so we really wanted to have Chris back to kind of get into more of the nitty gritty and details about what it's like being a pastor of a church that is looking towards Abbey behaviors. Um, and that kind of goes along with the episode of today's show, which is field notes from a church that goes, quote unquote. And so we're talking a little bit about the going and some of the notes. Yeah. So welcome back, Chris. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be back with you guys. I feel like uh, being with you is something I'd like to do all the time. <laughs> Isn't it nice that we kind of get to? Yeah. Oh, that's right. We Spoiler do. alert. But, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's say that in that this is an interesting situation because in today's conversation, we have, Chris, you've been the pastor of Covenant Life Church since what year? Uh, 2014, a uh, little over eight years now. Yeah, and so we'll kind of get into a little bit of the story of how kind of this the story of Covenant Life Church has evolved into a church that goes. Um, but let's go ahead and, like you're saying, spoiler alert, say that part of what has happened is in the local church situation in in Atlanta, here where we are, we're up in Gwinnett County, which is the northeast side. It's an extremely diverse uh, area. Um, Chris, you're leading a church, and then in the same church is the office for a kind of a ministry team called Boy with a Ball, which is a nonprofit. We work internationally, and so there's some synergy. So we actually do, all three of us, get to work with a lot of other leaders mm -hmm. all the time, which is wonderful. But um, so, you know, let's just start at the beginning a little bit. So this, how would you best characterize, you were, you were an associate pastor at this church back in the 90s, you were pastor of a church in San Antonio, and then you came back into ministry here. Uh, these years ago, like, how would you characterize um, 
a little bit of where this church was as far as kind of the shift that we're watching for churches. Uh, it, you know, this isn't a typical church. It's not like every other church, but what kind of church was this? Uh, what would you say your heart was as far as kind of turning towards outreach? And then, you know, tell a little bit of, of the story of, of um, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe go there and then we'll kind of go into a little bit of piece by piece how the shift started to occur. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so this church, uh, the church that we're talking about is in Lawrenceville, Georgia, which is the uh, county seat for the second biggest county in the state of Georgia, Gwinnett County, almost a million people now. And uh, the church uh, has been a really sweet, wonderfully uh, connected and community minded group, uh, very um, loving towards one another. You know, the kind of church that you see everyone come out for a move on a yeah. Saturday if someone was moving or or certainly if someone had a baby, meals were being brought in and out and uh, not out, just in, hopefully. Uh, and they were they were a group that really loved each other well. It's a fairly moderate sized church, you know. I think they say the average church size in America is about 55. So it was bigger than that, but probably 100, 250 people, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on the time. And a long history, the history that each other, each person had with each other could last decades. Um, uh, the pastor before me was actually my father-in-law. Uh, he was here for 27 years. And in the 90s, uh, he and the elders here asked me to come in and be an associate pastor. That's some of the time that I got to spend a lot of ministry time with you, Jamie. And um, and it was really a tremendous group. They wanted to focus on young people during that time. So it was just an opportunity for us to turn and reach the young people that were coming to this church. But um, but this church has pretty much been encapsulated. It's not been a church. It was not historically a church that was really out in the community. Uh, that was. Uh, they certainly prayed for the work of the harvest. They prayed for workers. I don't know how many of the workers were here. They were loving and praying and really wanting to see God do something. But we were kind of um, we were kind of just set and so. The time for my father-in-law's ministry was coming to an end, and the elders in the church here, the leaders, uh, really knew that we were going to have to take a step. We were going to have to step beyond ourselves, outside of where we'd been, uh, that we had been a great, healthy church for caring for one another, but there were many, many others out there that that we were responsible to go and and to encourage and to strengthen and to reach and to see many of them brought into the kingdom, made disciples. And, and so we really began a shift about 2014 uh, with my coming in as leaders, as the senior leader and many of the rest of the leaders with us to say, how can we not only love God and love each other as the commandment gives us, but how can we love our neighbors? How can we go beyond where we are? And how can we as a community be that minded, a mission minded group, a group that's not just comfortable with who they are, but it's really going where he's called us to be. And so that's been a journey for the last eight years. It's been a lot of hit and misses. It's been a lot of things that we've journeyed into and learned a lot. We certainly are not experts by any stretch of the imagination, but there is a culture shift that's occurred where we are no longer uh, settled with just settling. <laughs> we are determined to go. We are determined in each and every opportunity to be out there in our neighborhoods, workplaces, schools, um, wherever the Lord would send us. And so that's every person in our group. And that's kind of the shift that we are still underway with. And so um, John Duke, who is the pastor, he was a really prophetic, uh, kind of a profound leader, could could really develop people that people really knew each other. I mean, it's an extraordinary church in the way that people knew each other. You just, I think if people could get in there and go make it through 45 minutes of a sermon, because John could speak for a while, what people would touch, they would say was extraordinary. It's not necessarily what you find in every church, but, but John himself, he had been, he'd been involved in some evangelistic things back when he was in Bible school and that he had a heart for it, but he just recognized there was something that kind of could change. Um, but you as well, you know, and I was kind of your assistant back in the nineties, 
you were always kind of looking for different ways to to invite people in. I mean, you, you always had an evangelistic pursuit. I don't know that we were ever killing it, but we were learning. Would you would how would you would you characterize that? I mean, we did the house, for instance, which was a That's Saturday night coffee house that was uh, advertised on the the cover on the top of Papa John pizza boxes. But that's right. Y- it was it was in your heart to go that direction as well. But but you were I I wouldn't say you'd necessarily found every answer. Would you? Was is that right? No, that's true. I I think being in youth ministry, seeing so many young people all around us and many families that were just struggling. It's always been a desire to see those brought into the kingdom, uh, the message of the gospel being brought to them in a way that is life uh, changing and really course correcting for them. Uh, So, yeah, we were doing several different kinds of things. You mentioned the coffee house. It was for us, it was cutting edge. Uh, I don't know that we burned up anything as far as a great results, but it taught a lot of the team that was involved that there is a mission way beyond us. And it kind of built some muscles in us to be looking for things outside the the box and things that we maybe would not do. It was all still kind of in keeping with trying to get people to come into the church, though. And that's a bit of a a difference is that it was still designed to get others to come to us. And that's a shift that I think has kind of... um, that's we've shifted away from that into a place where it's not so much about getting people to come to us. The question is, is are we willing to go to where they are and can we build a bridge there? No, that's great. I'm going to kind of turn to you, Christine, a little bit, but say, you know, one of the things that's impacted us is looking at the power of a local church. Um, it's a, you know, what we would call a modality. It's it's a spiritual house. It's a household. It's a group of people where a miracle happens. They come to meet Jesus. They start to do life together. They're they're living out Acts 242. They're and they're amazing. And honestly, that's supposed to be a missional outpost, of course, and it needs to be. And and yet we're struggling with that as as everybody would admit. But one of the other things that was critical to the early church were also sodalities. And you see it in Paul's missionary band. Uh, you see it in Jesus's group. You see it in John the Baptist's group. Um, and you've seen it over history in different situations, including specifically in somebody we really take notes from uh, with St. Patrick's group, where they would have the Abbey Church, but they would also have these these missionary bands that would go out. And Boy with a Ball is a kind of a missionary team. It's a team that develops teams like that all across the world, including in Africa and Latin America and then across the U.S. We were looking in 2013 to where to put our global office. Uh, we had come back from Latin America. We had been in San Antonio for a while. It's hard to be an international group in Texas, as every funder or person we met with let us know. So we were looking at maybe Boston, maybe D.C., and and as John Duke was knowing he'd be stepping out, knowing Chris, you would be stepping in, he just kind of said, why couldn't you be based here? And his perspective is, he felt like, first of all, of course, he said, we have an unusual friendship, an extraordinary friendship. And that's true. So the levels of trust were very high. But he also saw that the church had the foundations of knowing how to live a life of love, that if it could be teamed with it, with a team that was going out to love in ways that maybe the church hadn't yet discovered that it could be lightning in a bottle. I don't think he would have said those words, but that was the kind of sense he had. So, so he kind of put into play, why don't you guys come here? And in, in July of 2013, uh, Boy the Ball's global office is relocated here. Uh, there we, we, he finally, John invited us to actually office in the church. We tried to push away from it. When we pushed out into a, an office outside the church, the Lord brought us to our knees and pulled the organization right back into the church offices. So what's really intriguing is you're hearing a lot of groups saying that, hey, churches are in a moment where they've plateaued, they're culturally irrelevant, they're dead, they're wounded, they're declining, they're institutionalized, they're traditional, they're dysfunctional, they're stagnant, they're broken, they're stuck. And they're kind of locked into this idea that the whole world's got to come to them, like you mentioned. But the thing, um, and so then what they'll say or what groups will say is, how do we get out of that mindset and try to get people to come in our doors and care for the lost? 
And that's usually when you're starting to see groups and churches try to find a new evangelistic approach. That's the way they're thinking. But what happened as the Boy With The Ball team came together with Chris, you, and as you started to shift the leadership team, what happened was something different, which was a church that was good at loving one another starting to be mobilized to go. And you alluded to that. And I know we're going to talk about some key pieces that you've seen in that. But Christine, you grew up in the church, but then you had been with Boy the Ball internationally. Like as you watch that happen, what else would you say about that transition? Yeah, I mean, I think we've kind of said it, but it, the church has always been a place that loved each other really well. And if you could make it to the door, then you were loved really well. Um, what's happened recently in the last eight years, started eight years ago, but then in the last even like four years, was as people have been sent, whether it's through Boy the Ball initiatives or um, some of the different Boy the Ball initiatives has inspired other initiatives or um, ministries, um, the idea hasn't been to bring people to church, but just to be with where people are. People right. have then started coming to the church. Yes. Um, it's been really, which is like, it's very counterintuitive. Um, but I think that that has been the biggest change I've seen, where it's been less focused on how can we get, and not that the church ever had a focus on how to um, grow the grow seats you know brother john always i remember meeting with him several times he felt like part of his ministry was to send people to other ministries um and that one day they would sew back they would sew back into the church and i think that's what this is all has happened yeah. it's right. um but uh because at one point he said he's like well I have, you have to go you have to go to you're, you're the one of the ones lord has said i have to send away and so one day you'll come back and i did um but um it's been really really interesting to see because even in the last year the fruit from not requiring membership or anything from anyone, but just in meeting people where they are in the community, whether that's at a university or a neighborhood or in the workplace, um, the, the amount of people that have been added to us is wild. Yeah, so I'll list something real quickly, and then it'd be great to just get to, Chris, kind of your thoughts. We can just kind of walk through them. But so as the team came in, all the Boy the Ball team leaders connected then with the Covenant Life Church team leaders and kind of became one. Uh, leading home groups together, engaging each other, participating in life together. So that happened. But then Boy of the Ball launched Love Your City, which is a community development outreach in economically kind of disadvantaged neighborhoods where they go out, uh, mostly they start on Saturdays where you go out into a community and you spend two hours going out and getting to know every community member. And there's other podcasts where we talk more about Love Your City and we will. But you really have a chance to just walk into a neighborhood, meet every boy, everyone, and start to connect volunteers, which began to include church members and their unique skill sets with the unique giftings in the community and even maybe some of the roadblocks they were facing. And so crazy things happen, like a tutoring center led by a school teacher, some of which were, um, all of which are in the church. Um, that was a high powered tutoring center. That in the was, church now. Yeah, that's true. That's the other thing is you started, we started something like that where you had your husband who's got a, a master's in education and is, you know, sharp as all get out. He starts this tutoring center, but then uh, some of the teachers from the church all of a sudden have this way to make a difference in the community. But then also one of the daughters of one of the new members gets invited and she sees where she's relevant. And before she knows it, all of her friends uh, that she's serving with in the community that she loves, they go to this church and she ends up at the church, which of course made her parents very happy. So we saw stuff like that. So Love Your City in the community creates a place where at least once a week, but then really multiple times a week with an ESL class on Tuesday nights, to, uh, tomorrow, we'll all be together with probably 20 to 30 of our church members in a Christmas fiesta, giving out 300 something gifts and cooking hot dogs, of course, because they're so holiday focused in their uh, <laughs> taste. Huh? But so you have this incredible opportunity to create a, a way for a landing place for people members from the church to go and meaningfully give what they give, to do the loving that they've been doing with each other now extended outward. But then also, uh, Chris, yesterday you were in Velocity, which is kind of the same dynamic, but within a school where in public schools, you're training high schoolers to mentor middle schoolers, but you need a bunch of volunteers alongside. So we've got several of the different members from the church in there. The leaders from Boy the Ball all find life in the church and they power things. 
But then the leaders in the church catch on to those things and start doing the same things in their own neighborhood. Right. What we haven't found is that the people in the communities where we're going are all flooding into the church, though we have seen a really strong flow of leaders. But what we have seen like crazy is of the volunteers, the college students, even families, even leaders who've come in to volunteer in the community with Boy the Ball, they've ended up kind of flooding then into the church. And there's just been a strong explosion over the last few months after COVID where you're really just seeing the church grow in every culture, race, uh, it's every age demographic all flooding together. So you're the pastor standing up there most Sundays and speaking out like that's a quick overview, but what are some other things that you would use to fill in the description of it? And then you, you've kind of been thinking about some of the key pieces of it. And I'd like to get to that too. So, yeah. You've described it so well. I would say that having a team like Boy With The Ball um, that's teaming with the local church, like our church, has been catalytic for us. It has not only been an example to other believers that are in this church, but it has ignited something in them. So many of them will volunteer for these different efforts at Love Your City or an ESL class volunteering there or uh, in velocity, but then others, as you mentioned, are doing the same kind of thing in their own neighborhoods yeah. where they're really connecting with their neighbors in a very meaningful, significant way, having get togethers with them, inviting them to a cookout that a small group might have been hosting, but it's really designed to know their neighbors and encourage that. And so it's been catalytic for us as a church. Uh, and those that don't feel as capable of doing some of those things, they've gotten excited about praying about really interceding on behalf of those that do go, or others have been excited about giving towards it and being able to donate on a regular basis and seeing the flood of people that are coming into the church, not because we're inviting them to come to church, but because they've just been so changed by this group of people that are going and loving that they want more of that. They want more of whatever made them what they are. They want that for themselves. And it has this, this momentum to it that is so much different than just inviting someone to church. It's inviting them into a journey of really changing a city, of changing a school, of changing a neighborhood. And, and I tell you, especially younger people, um, you know, whatever generation you want to say, quite frankly, older people want this too. They like to see things change and they love to see it at a grassroots level. So it's been phenomenal to watch. Many of the people coming in are, as you said, the volunteers that have, have heard about Boy with the Ball or Love Your City. And they've come along to see if that's something they would do. And the more they get there, they're like, I got to have more of it. So they just kind of show up to church and they get involved in a small group. You know, one of the, the pieces for us that's been really exciting is to watch the formation of our youth ministry uh, that has really touched not just the young people of our church, but these communities that we're going into. And so at one time we, we really thought, and I think Joey and Molly, who are youth pastors, they I think they've given, uh, they've been on a podcast with you to talk about this dynamic. So you should go back and listen to that episode. But they, at one time, we were thinking, maybe we should do a youth group at the community where we do Love Your City on Saturdays. Maybe we should do a youth group around the students at Velocity, where there's a deepening relationship, and they want to go further in those relationships, and, and, and in the process, they're meeting Jesus. And then we do a youth group for our church. But the more we thought about it, we thought, that just seems silly. Like, why would we do three groups when it seems like we could blend those things together into this really amazing Abbey-like missional youth group. And it has been phenomenal, Jamie, to watch those, um, those young people coming in to knowing and belonging. And in that process, they are not only uh, having the, the life of Jesus incarnated to them, they're not only seeing the power of his love demonstrated to them, but they're, they're beginning to hear the word of God. They're beginning to hear the gospel message proclaimed to them in life and in, in word as well. And so we're seeing young people coming into faith and wanting to be discipled. They're, they're following Jesus now. And our youth group is just an amazing group of diversity, probably half of which don't come to our Sunday gathering. Their families have a different dynamic. They, they might go to a different church. They might not go to church at all. But those young people are as much a part of our church community 
as anyone that's been here for 20 years. In fact, I was just at the event uh, last weekend where several of them were at this Super Saturday Velocity event. And two of them that are not a part of our church on Sundays, but very much a part of our church on Saturday nights at the youth group, they come right up to me, hug me. It's like there's a connection. There's a, a spiritual dad fathering, grandfathering thing for them. And it just made me realize that the going and the, the reaching into those places is making disciples we wouldn't do otherwise. And there's a that's kind of focusing in on one aspect of it, but it's a, a fun one to focus on. But even as you're talking about that, of course, the positives for the church is our church at that point didn't have a lot of young people. So you you could have got everybody there. You might have had eight young people mm -hmm. there. You know, if they brought friends, you might have gotten to 11. But quickly, when you go ahead and you combine those groups, we started within about a year hitting 30 and, and sometimes 40, right. and it can even be bigger. So those are the positives. Uh, the group of kids in the church that show up for a six-member youth group and kind of, you know, you're already feeling kind of weird about yourself because you're a young person, but now <laughs> you're part of a six-person youth group. Instead, they're part of this vibrant group. So that, of course, is that's a positive in a big way. Um for the kids in the community, they come into this church environment where it's very caring. It's kind of a cool building to them. That's not the kind of building they hang out in. It's got a big green space. Their families love it. So for them, it's really, really great. Um, of course, for Joey and Molly and the youth team, which kind of balloons up because a lot of people become passionate about working with the group, it's positive. But it's an interesting challenge in that for if I'm a parent of one of those six to eight <laughs> kids in the church of like, before, though there's only six six kids and my kids may not enjoy the youth meeting, I'm at least, I feel so safe. I've known all these families for 25 years. And I remember I was there when you were born and stuff. But now your six to eight kids are surrounded by 20 to 25 kids that you've never seen before. And that are kind of flooding into the church uh, sanctuary foyer. And it challenged our parents who you on Sunday mornings were kind of pushing us towards just the missional heart of God. He's ascending God. Uh, you know, the Father sends the Son, the Father and Son send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sends us. So you're saying those things. People are nodding their heads. But then on Saturday afternoon, they're really having to wrestle through, I am giving my children into this. Right. Uh, do, do I trust, right. trust it? And granted, there's a lot of expertise about how to lead something like that in, in order to do it well and right. However, it, that's a whole nother way where the message is coming home and forming them. And I would just say uh, the report back is that they they did great at that. Um, so that so that was really, really great. Um, what are some other things, Chris and Christine, that you guys have seen that are are key pieces that maybe would surprise a group that's that's saying, OK, I, I think I like what you're talking about. So I'm not just trying to do a better job at putting breadcrumbs out to get people into my sanctuary. I'm walking out into this kind of work you're talking about. What are there, what are other pieces that that you would want to throw out there to help people decide whether to do it or not? And then how would they do it? I think I have two thoughts that it may seem contradictory, but they go together. One is one thing you've already said, and I'll end with that. But it's I think one thing that's helped us is the fact that there had been such a history with everyone for so long where everyone deeply knew each other. Because then as we were talking about some of these shifts, I mean, while there was some people that were questioned it or were unsure just because it was new and um, was uncertain to them, but there wasn't a doubt that it was something the Lord was doing because there was a mutual respect um, for one another and um, trusting each other's ability to hear the Lord speak. Um, and so I think the it was a tremendous asset that the church knew and loved each other so well. Yes. Because then as people, the one thing that is a, a resounding echo as anyone has come to the church or encountered people from the church is how oh, everyone just loves each other so well. Mm -hmm. um, I heard that actually there was, um, we, my husband and I lead a small group here at the church and we, um, our small group reformed in March. Um, it was, it was bigger. So we split it. Um, and so then and people were added. And so as we were kind of re coming together, we've had everyone share their story, their testimony, just so everyone can know each other better. Um, and this is a, man that has joined our group, our church in the last six months. And he was saying one thing that stood out to him that was just so shocking was his first Sunday. He wasn't just greeted by people at the front door. 
but in the bathroom and in the hallway and as he was sitting down in his chair he just kept meeting people but it made him feel he's um he is from the caribbean he's haitian and it made him feel like he was with family because um haitian culture is very much very family oriented and very welcoming and they're always like hugging and all that stuff and so he felt like immediately that was what he'd been looking for and he'd, he hadn't encountered that outside of his family's church um and so he was like and he knew that that was where he was supposed to be um I know you're smiling because I said a thing about the bathroom. But. Yeah, we're just those bathroom greeters. <laughs> yeah. They're so it's, good. They're just, <laughs> they do a great job. You're washing your hands for the whole ABCs or the Happy yeah, Birthday right, song. Right. So you have, keep, can I have keep a going. long what conversation? Was your second one? Um, but then he is ascending God, and so, um, I think, you know, what has struck people has been, well, he's ascending God, but we're sitting. And so mm. then where are we supposed to go if he's sending mm. us? Because we're yeah. all being sent somewhere. Um, and so I think if you're listening and that your question is, oh, where am I being sent? Well, you're being sent somewhere because he is ascending God. He's not a sitting God where we just, he doesn't call us to sit. And that's something we have been learning as a church is how to not just sit, but to go where he's going. If you don't know where you're supposed to go, then go with whoever's next to you and see where you end up um, and what that's he right. says. Yeah. That's right, Christine. I, I think for me, watching uh, the realization by so many people in the church that what they are doing Monday through Friday or Saturday is very much a mission field. And recognizing, for example, we have we have eight or nine teachers in our small church of 200 people. And it's uh, it's amazing when you realize that that is a pretty significant percentage and those guys have really faced a great deal over these last couple of years. We know that. So being able as a church to pray for them, to encourage them, to build them up, and to help them see that we see them as missionaries in every one of their classrooms, in their schools, with their students, with their teachers, uh, co-teachers, and with the parents there too. And so it's a strengthening piece so that they know as they're heading out, they're also being sent in that place, whether it's medical professionals or businessmen. Uh, business women that are out in the marketplace, they recognize that their going is very much a piece. And they may get the chance to team as well with others that are in that place that are believers and see good results. Yeah, you know, I think the impact that surprises people, because everybody knows everybody wants to have a bigger church. You know, everybody wants to grow. And by the way, our church is just growing like crazy. And financially, we've grown like crazy, though we hardly take offerings. Like it is, and it's not, it's just wild. Um, it's almost like you win the heart of God and he just starts to bless it in the middle of right. it. But um, so everybody would be wondering about those things. But um, they may even wonder in order to reach the next generation, you have to become a church that goes. And that would be a reason for many people that listen to this podcast that they would want to go for it. And I think that's a good one. The next generation struggles when what they see of the church doesn't reflect what they read in the Gospels and, or the Book of Acts. So I think that's a great reason. But the surprising piece is that element of mobilizing believers into action, from, from being spectators to participating. We, we always like kind of go a little over the top to characterize it as consumers or stuff like that. But sometimes the only thing that churches sometimes can be set up for is, is spectating. And so, right. so the opportunity to say that, yeah, Chris, you have a really vital role on Sundays and across the week, as do all of us as elders, as do Pete and Christine as small group leaders. But saying we're all equippers and supporters of everybody, every one of you, you're not spectators, you're participating in this mission. Every ounce, right. every piece, every, everything counts. Your work, the way you treat employees, the way you treat customers, the way you pay for your gas, the way you get to know your cashier. And and really what it's done is allowed churches like ours that have found this to say we we don't want spectators anymore. Like we we right. don't want it. And nobody wants to be a spectator. But then the second piece that that leads to is a focus on ordinary people multiplying themselves. Mm -hmm. So the the exponential uncorking of of capacity is is kind of amazing. 
Well, we're coming, we're coming close. We just passed the 30 minute mark of getting to talk to you. So, and we will keep, I like the way that we titled this today because it's filled notes, which means we can do part we can two, do it again. part three, but <laughs> you know, as, as you're, as you're standing in the middle of supporting a group of leaders and kind of guiding and talking to leaders and watching the growth and seeing the people popping in on Sundays and seeing them grow in groups, what, what would be some of your you know, final takeaways, Chris? Well, I would just say to uh, any leader that's listening to this, considering how does this work for us, um, there are a few things that you really have to shift in your thinking. And, and one of those things, and this can be hard for pastoral leaders, for church leaders, is you have to stop being concerned about growing your church. And you have to become more concerned about expanding his kingdom. Um, I felt the Lord say to me clearly coming into this season eight years ago of leading this church along with the team we've talked about and other vibrant leaders is that God had called us to make disciples and he would build the church. And that has been so helpful to us. This growth that we're seeing is the byproduct of our obedience. It is, um, it's, um, it, it's, it's the prize, but it's not what we prized uh, put a put a prize in our mind. We were pursuing obedience to the Lord. And so I think that's not only uh, pleasing to the Lord to be um, about his kingdom and following him as he sends us, but I think it's very attractive to other people that are seeing, is there anybody out there that's authentic? <laughs> if, if they really believe the message and the words of Jesus, are they living it like that? And that really is appealing to them. I would say the other piece too is that as you have dynamic teams that could really grow within your church, that could be the catalyst. It could be a, a group of people that's serious about praying and reaching into a neighborhood that's desiring to go. Make sure that that team can um, get good covering from the church and support and not be a threat to one another. It's not a competition. It's actually a a partnership. It's a harmony. It's a working together. And the more that you can do that and not be threatened by those that are really dynamic and outside the walls, because it's going to benefit those that are inside, but where both of them are in harmony with one another. I think we've had real successful, successful parachurch type ministries in the historic in history, history, but and we've had very, his, very great uh, churches that have been successful, but to have a team and a house that could work together um, that would be a really important piece, especially for this day. Yeah, we have a, here in Atlanta, we have the Love Your City Conference at the end of May. No, yeah. June 1st through 3rd. Yeah, very beginning of June. And so that's a great place to come because really what we're saying is that there's this new piece for churches. Of course, you have your great leadership team, but also these these missional outreach teams that have a slightly different focus that are working in concert together, those two, the leadership team and that. So as you're thinking about that or thinking about starting that, you feel like you're at ground zero. Of course, our church, uh, this church, Covenant Life Church, and then boy of the ball, we're, you know, we're not going to hog all this. And if, if you call us or email us, we'd love to talk and, and we'd love to just see that conference once a year filled with more and more groups where we can all learn from each other because we're onto something. But I think the final thing that is so impactful to me is like we recently realized we had about 30 people come to the church in a very short period of time. But it was like, I think 85% of them were all, by the time we talked about it in an elders meeting, they were all being discipled actively. So you're not yeah. just talking about, you're not just talking about outreach, actually. You're talking about a, a way of outreach that is going right into discipleship. And that is great gain. You know, it's just very powerful. Very much so. Well, thanks for joining us today. It was my privilege. I love doing it. I'd love to do it again. It's great. Well, that was great. We got to sit down with Chris Hyatt. He's a pastor at Covenant Life Church. Good looking guy. Known him forever. Best man at my wedding. <laughs> Irrelevant to this podcast, but fun to say. <laughs> okay, so I saw you over there. You were taking notes. You were doing backflips. You were doing a lot of different things. Uh, what were you thinking about as you heard that that back and forth conversation? Well, one, I don't recall a backflip, but 
Hmm. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> I you your made that up. Okay. Um, I was thinking a lot of things. Yeah, I was taking notes. I really enjoy the conversation. I think it's an important one. Um, specifically um, around, there's a lot of conversation around the growing church or the decreasing church. Um, there's even, you know, Tim Keller talks a lot about how the way we've been doing evangelism doesn't work. Um, or ha- the way we've been doing the evangelism doesn't work anymore. Yes. Specifically with culture shifts this generation, but then the shifts in a post-Christian America. Yes. Um, and I think what we've seen and what you've heard in as as Chris was sharing as kind of we were speaking, um, is the the trick cats out of the bag isn't to actually try to get people to come to church, yes. but it's to get to where people are and just love them where they are, and then somehow people get to the church. Um, but it, I mean, it makes sense. It becomes way less about your thing and what you believe and what you want and way more becomes about what people need and where they are and how they can find Jesus where they are. Um, and some people will come to your church because of that. Other people will go to another church because of that. And either way, it's Chris said it, it's less about growing the church, his church, and more about growing the kingdom, extending the kingdom. Um, and I think that's where that's a big paradigm shift for us as a church, big C church and little C church. It's way less about our thing and way more about just God's thing. And the king, the kingdom of God is bigger than whatever your local church context is. And so getting out of your local church context and to step into where he's sending to extend the kingdom and not to extend your mission, I think is something that we all need to learn to do better. Yeah, I think what you just said is the core reality around this entire podcast and around everything that's happening these days. Um, we There's a lot of people that are really scared and they're watching the ground shift under them and they're really hurting and they're very afraid. And often we can characterize it as an older generation, but really older and younger are both a little afraid and that things are shifting. I mean, for the younger generation, there's even mental health issues in it. For the older generation, they're sitting in church, they're watching it not work, and they're thinking it's because there's just this corrupt younger generation. For a younger generation, they just can't connect with what's happening in churches. And so when it's all happening, it's easy to think the devil's winning, he's beating us up, this is horrible, this is a rough time, you know, we need a revival. And of course, sure, we need a revival. Of course, when do you not? (laughs) But I think the thing that you're saying is that this is nothing surprising to jesus this is a part of him beautifying the body of christ this is not where the enemy is winning this is where the lord is coming after us around our behaviors and our hearts that have been insufficient incomplete immature the idea that as believers that represent jesus that it's all about us is crazy it's bananas let me say this if you're a church member if you're a church leader and you think that's the way it is, what are you talking about? I mean, go back to the suffering servant songs of Isaiah or just the nature of Jesus. He who seeks to save his life will lose it. So, And I think when somebody slaps us across the face and pours water on us, we come to our senses and realize that's crazy. But that's what you're saying. And so what's being required of us is to change from being loopy, from being self-centered, from being lazy, from being, you know, um, faithless or at least not agile and um you mentioned tim keller and he he talked about that there were six quick postures that need to happen in this time and his first one is we have to become a community of contrast in other words we have to be different like if we're going to draw people we have to live an attractive gospel they have to see something in us and to be power brokers you know trying to win your right or win your thing and stay where you are and get everybody else who's not as good as you to change to be like you. There's nothing different about that. Everybody's like that. Every every weird group, every jerk, every curmudgeon is just like that. So to be first, we have to be a community of contrast, and I think there's that. Second, serving. Like you know, Jesus, being of the very nature of God, did not consider equality to be something to be grasped, but took on the very nature of a servant. We have to join him in serving. So. If you want to meet somebody and draw them to Jesus, if they don't find you serving and loving, then you're misrepresenting the Lord and and the kingdom of God. 
three unifying. Like there's so many ways where you can sharpshoot people, but it, that is so unattractive, you know. But then lay leader launching, which is really taking people, everyone, and getting as many people out there into loving and living a life of love, which is so much in what we heard Chris talk about for Covenant Life Church. Uh, number five, suffering. Like we all act like the moment somebody steps on our toes or responds to us incorrectly from the world, we start screaming and crying and talking about how they hate Jesus. But Jesus, you know, he didn't, he didn't lift his voice. You know, he, he, yeah, he didn't. He turned the, the turning the other cheek messaging, the, the suffering well, the being patient, the endurance, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They're watching us. There's a world without Jesus watching us try to get them to act perfect. Um, and they're just wondering why we're not deeper. So suffering is a key part of it. And when you go out to love a community, you do suffer. And finally, being a community of the word or prophetic, where we're living out the Bible and it's it's authentic, but also where there's a prophetic edge, where as we're going, there's there's something there. So I think you're right. I think where we get to the point where it's not about the church, the church is about the church, the church is about the kingdom, and it's about loving and serving, and it's about caring, it's about living the way Jesus lived. I think what we're being invited into is an upgrade. It's deeper. What do you think? It for sure is, um, but it requires much, um, which isn't, it's, it's, but it's what's always been required of us, which is like our whole hearts. Um, it's a crucifixion. It's, it's baptism, but it's a crucifixion of our preferences and the, and like it wanting to go our way versus his way. Um, but that is what is required. Um, and so, um, I think it's essential and it's the only way that it really works too. Um, because I mean, like, I don't want to build my thing and draw a bunch of people to my thing. Um, and there's no good examples of where that's gone well in the Bible. (laughs) Those are all the, like, the Tower of Babels or the kingdoms that then like Jesus destroyed with fire. Um, and I don't, I don't want that. Um, and so I think we have to evaluate, I mean, I have to evaluate like where the places and we said it earlier, but like he's sending, where is he sending us? And then where, where in our hearts are we sitting and not going where he's asking us to go is a question we all need to ask. Um, but then you mentioned it too, like the the shift in generations, while everyone loves to think they're so different, they're, the core issues are the same. It's Absolutely. insecurity. It's not knowing your place, being feeling relevant or irrelevant. No one wants to be considered inauthentic or insincere. Yeah. Um, it's just as you get older, you are further distanced from some of those internal insecurities or just because you've grown into yourself. But the, at the core, there's still an uncertainty and you want you want to be relevant. You want um, to be known by people. But the trick to that is also knowing people. It's knowing and being known. Um, and the best way to do that is to surround yourself with people that aren't don't just like look like you and have been at your church for the last 30 years. But it's to go where all of the people are and know them and then them knowing you. Um, and that is how the kingdom expands and grows. And it, you're right to say it costs everything. Uh, you have to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. But there's another side of it. It's very fun. Mm-hmm. Like, yes. just crazy fun. Very dynamic. If you want to see the power of God, you can hang around in your church where God has blessed you, increased your checking accounts and savings accounts, given you nice homes and nice spouses and nice children and a nice dog or parrot. Um, and not... Not everybody needs a miracle in that situation, you know. Um, but if you go into some of the communities in your in your in your in your city that are hurting, people there do need miracles. And when your child is next to you as you pray for somebody who's facing an, a need that requires a miracle, and you all as a family see the miracle come, or as a church see it, it changes everything. It adds to everybody. It's so much fun. Um, you see the power of God. You see life in the Holy Spirit. You see the requirement of being led by the Spirit. You see a leadership team for your church get sharper and sharper. And and then, of course, as we said, you see your church grow in the funniest of ways um, in the midst of this. But it's a, it's, a, it's a wild ride, but it's very fun. It is. 